All right. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to who's ever listening to this particular podcast. Uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Maitra Raghu, who is a senior research scientist at Google Brain. Uh, she completed her PhD very recently from uh, Cornell University, a PhD in computer science, and most of her research work focuses on analyzing internal working of deep neural networks that can help us better deploy these models, keeping humans in the loop. And previously, she did her bachelor's and master's in mathematics from University of Cambridge. And many of her awards, she has received many of awards for her research works, including the Forbes 30 under 30. So, um, hello and welcome, uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Raghu, for this particular podcast. Oh well, thanks very much for inviting me, Jay. All right. So, to learn more about your research interests and the projects you work on, can you tell us what what is the what is the research problem that you are trying to solve with your uh, projects? And can you mention a few of your works that you are currently working on? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I think broadly speaking, as as you know, you were describing my my research is really focused on. Uh, understanding properties of our our modern AI systems. And uh, a specific focus there has been really looking at their internals and really understanding what they're doing. So connections to things like interpretability and stuff also. Um, And I think the overarching theme motivating all of this is uh, ideally to help us build these systems in a way that make them easier to use for for people. Um, So really thinking about, well, at the end, they're going to be used. They have to interact with people. Can we make all of that better by actually understanding what's going on with these systems uh, also better. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm curious, like, does this fall or maybe intersect with the domains that is really popular right now, which is the XAI, like explainability, interpretability? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do, these, do these overlap or are, are, are we talking about the same thing over here? Yeah, I, I would say there's definitely overlap. Um, I think I broadly see my work as maybe falling into two categories. Um, so one part is thinking about um, the uh, design of these systems. Um, so you know, what kinds of insights can we get to better design these architectures? Can we preemptively predict the kinds of things that they might fail at? Like um, those kinds of questions. Um, and then there's like a, a connection between the design part um, to I think maybe some of the things that XAI has also been specifically focused on, which is the decision-making part. Um, so mm-hmm. after we've designed these architectures and then we, you know, we train them, we do all this work, and then we can put them out there. Um, and then there's like a whole another set of questions we have to ask, which is, well, now you know these architectures are going to be informing decision making in some way. Um, and you know, one application area we've looked a lot at is uh, medicine. And one interesting thing about that application area that's common to many other applications of AI and machine learning is that there are experts in this area. So when you're using these systems for decision making, it's not like you're not having the experts in the picture, the the system and the experts are trying to make decisions together. Um, So then there's questions of like, well, how can the system best assist the experts in performing this kind of decision making? And um, so there's some like explainability styled components to that also, or like some design and explainability styled uh, components that we've explored in, for example, um, some of our work thinking about uh, designing some of these architectures for medical imaging um, and thinking about the effects that uh, techniques like transfer learning might have, like are they likely to work well, are they likely to cause certain failures, um, things of that form, and, and you know how that might affect decision making. Um, then I'd say there's also questions on the pure decision making side, which is just what are we even predicting and why, like is that, is do we have the right task definition in mind, um, should we be thinking about a variation of that to help experts with decision making? Um, So that's come up in um, a lot of this work we've done on human AI decision making in medicine. Um, So thinking about things that will help help save time of doctors instead of necessarily having the system predicting like the end output alone all by itself, because again, typically it's like a partnership. Um, So sometimes the best things you could do for these like busy human experts um, is to help uh, direct their attention to you know the cases that might be most urgent or cases that mm-hmm. might be more most complicated also um and, and help with those kinds of ways um yeah 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 definitely i can i can relate to a few of these uh, uh use cases definitely and uh so i have seen like most of your research work like if i if i do a breadth of search on most of these uh, re- uh recent of your research works i see there are two types of research works any kind of uh, cs student can do is much more on the applied side versus theoretical or understanding mm-hmm. and so i to, in order to learn more like what really interested you more about the learnings of these internal uh, internal representations of these deep learning networks versus um 
using it for some kind of application, much more on the applied side. So in a sense, like how, what interested you more about this particular topic? And I also want to zoom out on that particular question is like, what interested you about deep learning in its first place? So right. how did you, how right. did you decide this particular topic to be your research and versus how did you get started into deep learning? Okay, so yeah, so I think I have answers for questions one and two. So on question <laughs> one and two, um, why I got excited about maybe analyzing properties of neural network representations and, you know, this question of like, whether is there a theory divide or like an applied divide and maybe how do you decide between those? Um, so actually, I think I got excited by some of these questions on representations because I feel like they bridge some of the theory and the applied part. Um, so, you know, one thing that I think I've really seen emerge as a research area, which wasn't quite as much the case, it feels like some years back, certainly when I was starting my PhD, is there are these intermediate sets of questions that, uh, you know, can be uh, somewhat connected to theory in various ways. Like it's really about understanding how something works or having something very um, systematic and principled that you're doing. Um, but there's also a very uh, like strong connection to the applied side because the way you're doing this systematic and principled understanding is actually through like a lot of experiments like so as some kind of like a systematic study. Um, and I think these kinds of approaches are very common in other areas of science, but um, at least in machine learning, it feels like it took us uh, some time because um, it's only after the system started getting more and more complicated that people were like, well, wait, actually we should take a step back and then really try and understand what's going on with some of these more systematic empirical studies. Um, so I was very excited about the prospect of doing some of these systematic ex um, empirical studies. I'll, I'll come to my uh, initial interest in deep learning in a sec, which also <laughs> had that connection. Um, and, and then when you start thinking about doing some of these um, systematic empirical studies, Studies, uh, it just felt like a huge uh, shortcoming when, when, at least when I was starting in the field, uh, is just. It there... still is. <laughs> okay. It still is. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so I, I really do think um, we have many more systematic empirical studies. So, so that's very exciting to see. Um, and then when I was getting started, it just felt like uh, we should also have more insights into what's happening in the internals of these systems because. That's where a lot of the complexity is. Like the input, you know, we've been understanding better and better. And then um, the output is usually very human intelligible. So it's easy to, to sort of test that and take a look at what's going on. Um, but the, the internals of how these representations are computed, how, how also like, you know, some of our models can learn such sophisticated things from the data, um, that felt like a real mystery. And so that, that's what really prompted me to think about studying the, the internal representations of all of these systems. Um, and then, and then, like I said, the other thing I liked is that I think through the course of my work also um, through, I don't know, like various results we've had from thinking about like how these systems like train or, you know, differences between different architectures to, you know, um, application specific considerations like, like, you know, medical applications and stuff, um, oftentimes by studying what's happening in the internal the internals of these system, um, you learn about like other phenomena that they exhibit that turn out to be very relevant, um, either for thinking about better designing them or better using them in some applications. So, so that was really exciting. And I felt like this really, this entire area has really helped bridge, well, not, not just the studying representations area, but more broadly has, has really helped to bridge areas of um, theory and, and practice and given rise to lots of interesting questions. So yeah, um, so, so that's how, that's how I see it kind of connect between like theory and practice. And I feel like there's this really exciting intermediate area that maybe has nice connections to both. Um, and as for what got me excited in deep learning uh, in the beginning, I can actually, uh, there's, there's a little bit of a story there, uh, which is I was starting, so I was starting my PhD back in 2014. Um, I think as far as the AI world is considered, that feels like, a, I don't know, the dinosaur era or something. <laughs> Yeah. We, we didn't have TensorFlow. We definitely didn't have PyTorch. Um, the first things I tried writing code in were Theano. So, um, so oh, it was just, yes. yeah, yeah. So it was, it was really quite different. And, um, <laughs> You know, so I, I started and I knew I was interested in machine learning, but I, I didn't know too much about the field or anything yet. I was still learning all of this. Um, and it so happened that NeurIPS that year, I have, I have one of my NeurIPS mugs here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> NeurIPS that year was um, taking place quite close to, to Cornell in Montreal. And um, in particular, the Women in Machine Learning workshop, which seemed interesting to me, was was taking place there also. Um, so I actually only attended that, that first NeurIPS in 2014 because I was planning on attending the Women and machine learning workshop. Um, so sort of we all went there. Uh, and then as soon as I got there, because the NeurIPS community at that point had like a reasonably large contingent that was very excited
excited about deep learning, you know, two years back is when like AlexNet and stuff had been introduced. So there was just a lot of excitement. Um, you know, that's when I first came across like the, the degree of excitement that there was um, in like a, a very core part of the community. So, um, so, so there, I have a like, you know, very memorable um, a moment of going to this talk, uh, which was, I think this paper on how transferable are features in, in deep neural networks, um, actually by someone who later became a co-author of mine, and then just sort of seeing some of these, one of these systematic experiments being conducted um, on, on one of these vision models. And there are two things that were really striking. Firstly, you know, the fact that this model could just learn to to like uh, detect all of these uh, pretty sophisticated things in natural images automatically was just super cool to see. Um, and then of course the deconstruction to understand what exactly was happening, like you know how the features were being learned was just uh, absolutely fascinating. So <laughs> I think from from that point on, I was uh, I was I was pretty hooked, and I was super excited to to work on this area. Yeah, definitely. This this sounds very interesting. And I always envy people who started the research works or at least had the chance of exposure from or after 2012. So oh. because those are the people who really know how the deep learning curve has emerged, right? Like people like me who started in, let's say, 2020, we are pretty much out of the bubble. Like it's like the bubble <laughs> has happened and we are just trying to cope up, you know? Yeah. yeah. yeah we, are, we are just trying to cope up. Like what happened? Okay, let's start back in 2012. We try to you know, go through all the citations. What's the what's the trend? So it's it's hard to keep up. But um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, but this, this sounds... Uh-huh. Oh, I was going to say, I, I definitely empathize about the dif difficulty of keeping up. I think that's a challenge everyone has. Um, but I mean, one maybe small positive, or actually one, <laughs> one pretty significant positive for now is it is much easier to do um, all of this research. So yeah. uh, I think back then it was, you know, it's just hard because uh, they didn't have nearly as much like, you know, software or packages out there or notions of best practices. Um, and so it was like the knowledge was c contained in sort of some pockets of people and you had to try and talk to those people or those groups to to understand how you could do this do this work and so yeah. so from that sense i feel like things are much more accessible now which is great uh but i, I do also think the field has sort of exploded now so i um yeah yeah, yeah but a, a, a strong caveat to that saying is like it's easy to conduct the research but it's hard to publish you oh. know Oh, so it's 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 oh I, I didn't knew iPad did that okay I didn't knew <laughs> it, it created that emoji because I did this okay wow. but um a, a strong caveat I've realized as a student and maybe this is just my first year talking into an is uh, oh. like it's easy to conduct research but it's really hard to publish because everything you you see out there like somebody has done something or the other similar stuff so yeah definitely but <laughs> Wait, I don't know. My, my Maybe my advice there would be, it's true, like there are a ton of people in the field and there's, uh, you know, there, there's definitely like, um, it, it's hard to not avoid some like overlap in ideas. Uh, yeah, that would be my advice. I mean, I do feel like there are certain directions that are underexplored, like for example, a lot of interdisciplinary directions. Um, I think there's a lot more scope to explore them. Um, you know, for all of this time, I think a lot of aspects of machine learning didn't work well enough for us to seriously consider some of the more interdisciplinary applications. And now I think that could be a much, uh, much more, um, yeah, uh, uh, like a, a much more solid and like reliable direction to go in. And, and so much more work that can be done there. Uh, I think some of the human AI decision-making is maybe also underexplored. Um, but then, you know, I don't know. My, otherwise, my advice would be, you know, definitely try and learn as much of the field as possible and, you know, learn what like some of the classical results are and stuff. So you're not, you know, reinventing the wheel. But like otherwise, yeah. it's also OK to get excited about a direction and a problem and then maybe get people's perspectives on that problem. So so, you know, whether, you know, it's an exciting thing to be working on and then, you know, spending some time trying to flesh it out and make progress without worrying too much about whether there's, you know, you're going to get scooped or something just to give yourself a bit of that space and and then and then once you've you know gotten some more concrete results and things then then kind of uh you know worry about like publishing it and things J just because otherwise you know like uh, ideas in some way like everything like like ideas like ideas that are an abstract can encapsulate like a lot of work and um you know, oftentimes, like the specifics of how somebody has done something, like there tends to be some variation in that, at least. So, so it's okay to give yourself yeah. a bit of space to explore those parts. Um, and then, you know, then maybe see about like pushing certain differentiating factors or something like that, if that becomes relevant.
Yeah, yeah. No, this is very meaningful, and and I just want to pin this thing, uh, these two topics because we will be revisiting them. Is basically exploring the interdisciplinary asp- aspects of deep learning research, and definitely developing a research vision, which definitely you you talk more about it uh, right now. But which I I want to explore more on that too. Sure. But uh, before before we got that, I'm, I'm just going to pin those topics, and we will revisit them later. But one of the key things that you mentioned, which got you interested or maybe hooked up into the deep learning research, was about the workings that you said, like right. Uh, how these models really work and how these yeah. uh, structures really operate right so can you tell like this is one thing i've explored and this is uh, even you would have gone through is like once we don't know how these deep learning networks everything about the uh, network really awes us like hey how is this working but once we start to learn more about the different components what are the mathematical functions and what are the uh, traits these uh-huh. models have we uh-huh. try to understand these better so okay. you have been working on analyzing the uh, structures and representations of these models what is one thing or one component of a deep learning network that you would still say that the still puzzles you you don't really know how that happens but it just happens through the magic of more data or like systematic data that we put in like uh, um right yeah, yeah go okay. ahead so just just something about deep learning models that even even as we've been unraveling their structure uh, you say um, surprises me, maybe in terms of yeah. like how, you mean in terms of how exactly it's like working. Um, as in, as in, you you wouldn't have the first intuition saying that this particular thing would work. As in, like it's it's such a simple, simplistic, or maybe non, not so not so complicated function. Like for example, for for me, it was the activation function. When I learned what 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 does a re- activation function does. If you if you see ReLU activations, it's simple as hell, right? Like you you won't even understand what is the significance of that but once you understand why did the person came up applying activation function functions to this particular input to produce this particular output at this particular stage it really okay. awes us like oh wow this is what it can be used for so I see. I see. that I kind see. of I see. yeah I see. you okay. can you uh-huh. yeah yeah well yeah. okay so 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 yeah so I th- I'd say like in in the details of like the mechanics of some of how some of these architectures work I say there are like so many things that um you know if you think about for a while you you'll just be like but why did we choose to do this or why did it work and then there are there are post hoc yeah. explanations but sometimes like the <laughs> pre hoc explanations are hard to do you know I mean occasionally we do things because somebody has like a great insight and has been like you know playing around and really understands like this is the right thing to do but you know that that tension between like uh preemptively knowing that and then sort of post hoc being able to reason about it is like, you know, definitely something that continues, continues throughout our fields. Like, I mean, um, mm. I mean, I guess most, most recently mechanically, as I was like um, on the mechanical side, while I was working with um, some of the work we've done on vision transformers, um, it was definitely kind of magical to me that we could just give them these additional tokens, which are going to become like these position embeddings. And it would just learn all of that like correctly. Mm-hmm. And those would have like a lot of meaning that would help it determine um, like, you know, spatial positions and things of that form. Um, so that was like pretty, uh, yeah, that was pretty magical. <laughs> and, yeah. um, as for like, I, I mean, maybe, maybe like a more, um, yeah, maybe like kind of stepping back from that and maybe uh, like away from the mechanics and just more um, high level on things that I wish I understood better. Um, I think I, I wish I understood better, um, I think maybe more of the precise effects of things like transfer learning and multitask learning. Um, so it's like mm-hmm. transfer learning, we got started with that, you know, with this this paper we had on studying transfer learning between natural images and medical images. Um, I still think, and you know, transfer learning has just exploded. Like every, everyone uses transfer learning. You've got it for like the, the natural language data sets. You've got it for like computer vision data sets. Uh, it's like everywhere. And yeah, I think I wish I understood better well, you know, like how exactly is it working and, and, and like really like into the details of like why, I mean, I, I understand some of it. Like, I think there are some earlier features that can be like reused, or at least there's like good conditioning that happens when you pre-train on certain things. And then somehow like you can use those same kinds of things for like, say like medical data sets or something. Uh, But then in that case, like, you know, if you can do that, then why do we still struggle with stuff like out of distribution, uh, like like images, for example? Mm. Why is it that we can have this flexibility happen here, um, and then and then you know like uh, yeah, but for like out of distribution, maybe it's uh, so like like somehow you see this failure. Like, can we can we really get at that um, and and understand statistically what's going on? 
Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, I think another thing, um, like, okay, so I guess I'm talking about a few things. So, so there's like the mechanical <laughs> stuff and thinking about positional embeddings. There's maybe some of these questions on things like transfer learning, multitask learning, also like you can end up with these different objectives. And then, you know, how does that go on to really influence like what the, the system trains and what are like, you know, similarities and differences as you play around with the objectives. Um, and then, yeah, some of these connections to things like out of distribution, like why, why is that hard for us still? How can we make that less hard? Um, and then, and then I think maybe on a, like kind of another sort of pure esque like question of interest is, you know, um, do we have good ways of like actually combining neural networks? So we've done things like distillation, we've done things like ensembling, but can we like go beyond that into like the actual weights and stuff, for example, and see how to put them together? That's pretty challenging, um, but I wonder if there's like better knowledge sharing that can happen. Um, and I think, oh. I think yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think that would be really interesting, just from the perspective, like for for like lots of reasons, because we tend to train a lot of models, so it would be uh, very exciting if we could just do some kind of combination, but like in a deeper way than like distillation or ensembling. Um, and then like with some of these like larger models that are coming out, like maybe this would give us insights on like how to extract specific bits of like knowledge. That's always been something that's interested me, like also related to transfer learning, which is, um, you know, do we need to be thinking about, you know, fine tuning the whole model? Can we just extract what we need from the model in some sense? And um, yeah, are there other methods for doing that? And, and just a curious question is like when you said um, the idea about like combining two models as in like fusing two more two train, trained models together as in yeah. uh, what was that the oh yeah yeah okay. yeah yeah yeah. Okay. yeah yeah and and like because um yeah because there is variation in like you know how these systems learn what they learn things like that um and you know we know this from some of the representational analysis we've methods we've done all of those things um but mm -hmm. uh yeah but then um like yeah so there are various insights we can get on their design but then there's also a basic question of like if we wanted to fuse a couple of models together how what what's the good way of doing that what's the good way of collecting their knowledge beyond ensembling or things of that form mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely revisit this particular question if we get the time after we have this one. Uh -huh. But this is interesting. I have never, never thought about this. Um, this is interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I, I want to jump into your uh, research domain. But before that, I just have one question. Is uh, this is something question I always had uh, when I started my PhD, and maybe uh -huh. you you graduated very recently, so I can ask this, and uh -huh. you would be the perfect candidate. I can ask is what is the difference being a researcher when you are in an academic setting as a PhD student versus at a big organization as in I, I see most of the research scientists they are pretty much working on very impactful projects because majority of the research works are being published that are the most influential ones or the most cited ones that really carry on forward are coming from the industry right so what is the difference uh, you have seen working as a researcher in both of these settings and what does your work routine look like as a senior research scientist yeah um so good questions um, so I think I think maybe this is like an academia versus industry style question. Um, I would say even on the academic side. Um, so I guess some context. Yeah, I did indeed recently wrap up my PhD. Uh, I also seriously considered um, taking up a faculty position. So I guess I got the full mm -hmm. experience from a PhD student to thinking about being faculty uh, to then also having this industry exposure. Um, so on the academic side, I think there is quite a big difference between when you're a PhD student versus when you're a faculty member. Um, and then on the industry side, there's like, you, you know, a research scientists, like degree of that form. And um, the differences between, uh, I'd say, yeah, like the some of the considerations for academia and um, industry and the similarities and differences between them, um, I think have also been influenced by how like the field has been changing over time. Um, so I'd say some years ago, so okay, there's a big difference between being a PhD student and being a faculty member. Like those roles are, are a little different. And, you know, I think that's probably going to be well understood. So maybe, maybe I won't go into that. Um, I'd say that like in terms of the type of research you might do um, in like academia versus like in a big research lab, like some years back, I'd say that um, there'd be quite a bit of similarity um, between it, um, just because I think the Maybe the field was even younger, um, though I think I think even like um, a few years back, maybe um, you were seeing a little bit more like so originally it felt like um, some of the modeling and things like that was happening in academia. Um, then, of course, some things like grew in scale. So then you saw like more you know, industry like efforts um, there on like, you know, various like modeling related things and stuff of that form. Um, I think I think right now, maybe one difference I see is um, so the field has gotten quite a bit more mature, I would say. 
Um, so I think there are some directions that are not as large scale in nature. And I think those are you know, definitely well represented in academia. And then there are sometimes people um, in industry working on them also. Um, there are also some other directions that uh, are just inherently a bit more large scale. Um, and I think those directions like um, are seeing like more, you know, industry like development and things um, these days because, uh, I, and I think that's also partly to do with like, you know, where the field is in that state. Like we've had this suite of techniques um, being developed and then like, you know, becoming really standardized. And then like, then the next question is like, how far can you scale that up? And, um, you know, I think in some ways that question is like very well represented in industry. Um, the other, I think the other uh, aspect or other difference that I've seen like quite recently, I would say, um, is also partially thanks to maybe thinking about things of more scale and stuff. Um, and, and actually maybe historically also, I think I'd say um, there's a little bit more um, of like a history and industry of having like larger teams come together to work on things. Typically because when you're looking at one of these like larger scale projects, you're gonna like need multiple people to really work on various aspects so you can build it out in that way. Um, so I think I think that's like um, those are some differences that you know I think we've seen, but I think these are actually historically maybe um, differences that have existed between industry and academia. Like I think fundamentally, industry and academia are trying to do slightly different things, um, and so it, you know it makes sense that there would be sort of some of these differences between them. Um, I think machine learning has been interesting because as a field, it's been quite new, and so as a result for um, a lot of the history, we've actually seen industry and academia be very close in the things that they try and do. Uh, but like historically, you know, that has definitely not always been the case. And there are there are definitely like, you know, stages um, in like the cycle of any sort of field in terms of how um, how it's being studied across industry and academia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree to that. And if if um, if I can add to that, is I have realized the same thing, but in a different sense. Is that uh, if you if you if you follow works that are strictly out of an academic settings, you see a lot of variety in terms of what are the trials uh, the person would have done, as in in terms of ideas. You know, the exploratory right. part is much more broader, yeah. versus the industry industry research is much more robust, as in like solving a particular yes. problem yes. or a kind of a, exactly. an application or something like that. Of course, it's research focused, but it, it is it is built in such a way so that you can reproduce and exactly. use it for different purposes. Exactly. But the yeah, academic academics are the ones who take the first shot at doing those things and exploring and um, uh, doing a lot of wrong things versus right things, and then uh, yeah, yeah, publishing yeah. government citizens. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think I think that is I think that is like definitely a part of it, and that is also representative of um, yeah. I think some of the differences in the like area, like definitely like in academia, the idea is to like explore lots of different things and also interdisciplinary things and stuff like you know just try out like what's going to be there like I think in industry I, this might even be true a few a few years earlier like even a few years back like e even when the field was younger and stuff um yeah I do think the emphasis if you're like for example trying to build a new model architecture or something is like really um aspects of like also pushing like the limits of performance and things um you know of course like industry research is huge so um I don't think this speaks for all research and I have actually not done as much work of that kind uh, simply because of uh, I guess my interests but um, but I think that is like a, a theme and there's like, there's obviously good things about it because then you can take this thing and then you can like reproduce it um, and use it in lots of ways. So like things like BERT, I guess, went off to be like enormously useful for a lot of people. Um, and, and that was um, fantastic. Um, and then there's, but then there's like flip sides to it, which is that they tend to be like more complicated or have like, you know, large scale. And then, you know, ultimately some of the like ideas that go into it or the things that really make it work might be more fiddly and things like there, there might not be something conceptually clean to take out of it necessarily. So there are all of those aspects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and jumping on that, onto that particular topic is, uh, so, so a little bit context for the people who are listening is, uh, so you, you recently wrote out a very, anal a very nice analysis article comparing the representational structures of vision transformers versus Typical, like the best uh, conversation alternative that we have is ResNet models, and I think uh, it, it was a very nice representational uh, comparison. And uh, so, a context, a slight more context, uh, zooming out as vision transformers was something they published out of Google research, where they are taking a very transformer. Um, architecture-based approach to solving imaging tasks that are typically normally always tackled using convolutions. So you did a very head-to-head -head comparison that's the best manner we can use for the standard datasets, ImageNet. 
So I'm, I'm curious, and this is something I have been using and trying to explore for even my projects that I'm trying to do for certain reasons. Like, of course, I'm not targeting accuracy in that particular reason, huh. but I'm curious based on your analysis, and I read the paper, but something uh, I want to ask uh, on an overarching question is, wow. where do you think VITs or the vision transformers have a clear advantage, if at all they have, uh-huh. to solving a particular task that convolutions might not have versus what are some of the tasks that you will say which are still inherent to CNNs? They cannot be solved using vision transformers and we could, we shouldn't expect vision transformers to overrule um, CNNs. Right. Um, so I guess in answering this question, maybe I'll also draw on some of you know the results we had in our paper. Um, yeah. So you know broadly, I'd say um, probably CNNs still have an advantage in places where you might not have um, you know, as much data, or you might not be able to easily perform things like transfer learning. I think I think if, in situations where if you can expect transfer learning to work well, you can actually expect the vision transformer to do a good job because um, they've been like testing that with sort of taking it and then having a pre-trained model and then seeing how it works as you as you fine tune it on different data sets and things. Um, but you know, if there are settings where you know you think this kind of fine tuning from from well, like you know one of these standard pre-trained um, setups is not going to work super well, then definitely the CNN would have the advantage there. Um, I think also you know the first results were uh, really only on image classification. I think there's like you know follow-up work going on extending that to to like other tasks like object detection. Um, I, I need to check, but like you know I imagine some of these other tasks which have taken us a while to develop just in terms of like CNNs might take like a little bit longer to to develop in terms of like um, vision transformers, we might have to revisit a lot of that design and then think about how we're going to do it again. And then similar for like, you know, aspects of things like image generation. Um, I think if I were speaking more fundamentally, I would say, I do think CNNs have a very um, powerful and useful inductive bias of the convolution. Um, and when when there's going to be limited data available, I, I just feel like I see that being very useful. Um, on the other hand, and this is just drawing on results of our paper, um, we find that because vision transformers don't have this inductive bias and like this, this convolution, and instead what they have is this global self-attention layer, um, if you can train them properly, sometimes that can lead them to um, that, that can lead them to getting very strong representations even earlier on in the network. Um, so one thing we find um, because this global self-attention, because it doesn't have um, this nice inductive bias. Uh, then when it like learns to do the right thing in some sense, um, it can incorporate, you know, some amount of like local information, it can incorporate some amount of more global information. Um, and what we find is that that leads to like um, very strong representations, um, even pretty early on in the architecture. Um, so you can do certain like linear probes like tests between the um, the, con- the ConfNet and the vision transformer. Um, so you'll go ahead to some intermediate representation and then you'll see how well it can classify on some task just based off of that intermediate representation. Um, and then in those kinds of evaluations, um, the vision transformer ends up doing actually uh, a lot better. And um, we think that's because it's it's managed to aggregate, it's managed to you know really utilize self-attention to, to aggregate things in a, in a more helpful way that prepare it to do things like that. Um, so I'd say that um, I guess that the vision transformer has access to, to enough data to be able to really make best use of its um, self-attention mechanism, then that can lead to some very strong representations that I think should actually give it a pretty strong advantage against um, CNNs, simply because they are they have this thing hard coded, and there is like also a downside to having things hard coded. Um, but on the other hand, um, there is this big thing of can you train the vision transformer to actually use its self-attention um, effectively in that way? And if you can't do that, then I feel like the the CNNs are going to be um, definitely better to go with because they've gotten the, the inductive bias they have, I mean, it's hard coded, but it's also been just enormously successful. And so, so that would be like a good direction to look into. Right. And and to understand the intuition, basically, like when we, we have this very fair understanding of what convolutions really learn, right? Like what yeah. are the, what, what, what do we mean when we say representations, when we talk about convolution neural networks, as in we have these techniques that has helped us in some way to understand, like, for example, the uh, outputs of uh, saliency maps or grad camps that help us understand and visualize these weights. And we can see actually what exactly the model is trying to learn. So um, um, this is this might be a very naive question, but when we do these kind of analysis, what is the learning? Like, because transformers, like purely transformer-based models don't have kernels or anything like that if yeah. if i'm if i'm if i'm right so what is the learning going on if if we, if we, if anyone was to wants to understand the intuition what's the learning representation 
what what is the representation in general going on in the model that is being learned in iterations or epochs? Yeah, so I think you could, so we didn't look at the saliency map things ourselves exactly, but I think you could do very similar analyses with the vision transformer and get good insights for what's going on for a, a couple of reasons. Um, so firstly, I think um, analysis of self-attention is um, you know, a relatively straightforward things to do, thing to do because you have this like notion of distance and you can think about how different distances are being attend, attended to and what's going on. We do some of that in our paper and then there's like nice structures we uncover. Um, one thing which I just mentioned which is this like local global information kind of thing. Um, mm. and, and, and so that that will give you some insight into to what's happening and how it's functioning. Um, and then for the other places, so like one, one nice thing architecturally about the vision transformer is that it takes in these image patches um, and then like, you know, it's and then all of its like work is transforming embeddings of these image patches. Uh, but then as a result, like you still have very good information on like, you know, what each patch is and then what each patch is mapped to as you go through the architecture. Mm. Um, and so like, you know, you could do all kinds of things. You could try and study magnitudes of like different patches or things of that form. Um, we touched on one such experiment towards the end of our paper um, motivated by object detection. Um, so there, what we were trying to do is take like, you know, um, take, take these image patches and then sort of take something much higher up the network that also, you know, came from one of these patches uh, and then try and get a sense of like, whether the transformer knew where that patch had come from, essentially. Um, so whether the transformer preserved spatial information well, and um, it turned out it actually did do a pretty great job of preserving spatial information. Um, so that was really cool to see. So we could kind of like walk around what patch we wanted to look at and then see the corresponding like thing light up at the top here. So, so that, that was that was really fun. Um, so, um, you know, there are those kinds of correspondences possible. And so I think we will see, um, yeah, we, we will see like many more analyses. Um, there's also, you know, a paper that was, I think almost released concurrently with ours, may maybe a little bit before where I think they took an even more um, fine grained vision transformer, by which I mean the image patches were even smaller so they could really probe what it was looking at. Um, and just by doing an analysis of the self attention, they managed to get like a saliency styled uh, Map. I think this paper was from Facebook. It might have been called Dino or something. Um, they have a yeah. They have they have a GitHub page. It's like it's worth looking up. It's it's very cool to see that. Um, and so I think I think those kinds of things um, will give us insights into what these models are um, are like doing and and how they're working. Like the, the transformer has a pretty regular structure in many ways. Like even more so than CNNs because they have a bit more of a pyramid like structure and stuff. And um, so from certain perspectives of analysis, I think it might even be easier to understand what's going on in the transformer. Um, so I'm excited to see what other kinds of things people discover with those models. Right, right, and and I'm 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 also curious. As in uh, in the original transformer model, they have mentioned this one thing is uh, the transformer model wouldn't work well than the standard ResNet results if we are using small sized or mid mid sized data sets, and yeah. they are referring to the ImageNet data set yeah, over yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, but it 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 would perform its beauty or whatever it 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 does when we are using large data sets. And yeah. like you said, uh, CNNs uh, still perform better when we have smaller data sets. So from understanding from a representational structure. Why does it take uh, long to learn its uh, whatever representations or I don't know I would say weights for now is like why does it why does the transformer model take longer or maybe bigger data sets to learn few things uh, compared to the CNNs like what is the what is the internal working yeah. going on that takes so, it or is it the is it the structure like you said the distances that is being learned over time and the spatial versus global information is that the reason that yeah, is causing so I mean, so one, so I can't claim this answers everything fully, but I think this is a really big factor of it is what happens with self-attention. Um, because the self-attention is the thing that you're really trying to get to act as like a, a convolution. Like it's um, it's acting across all of these tokens, like acting all, across all of these patches. So that's like the one thing you have for aggregating information. And like, otherwise you're, you know, doing also like patch level transforms and stuff. And so, um, so I feel like the question about, um, you know, what does it take to get it to work? Well, like really um, a really, really important component of that is like what is happening with the self-attention layers. Um, and so what we find is that with mid-sized data sets, if you train some of these larger transformer models, they don't seem to quite be learning to do the right thing with self-attention. So even earlier on in the network, their self-attention layers are just entirely attending globally. Um, and 
that might not be good for and in fact our suspicion is that isn't good for for image processing because you want to be able to take into account the local neighborhoods um whereas what we see when you take one of these same models and then train them with a, a much larger data set is that then these self-attention layers will actually learn to pay attention to neighborhood patches but then because they don't have hard coding they'll also learn to pay attention to like some amount of like further away patches and i think the combination of the two of them is um is quite important for having high performing transformer neural networks um, so I actually think this is a really fun open question if somebody wants to really go and specifically test this, which is just um, try and play around with the architecture to force it to learn things more globally and then play around with it in the other extreme side to just force it to learn things more locally um, and then see the, the ramifications of that on performance or, or maybe just do this ablation. But one thing we see when we train these architectures on, on different data set sizes is, is precisely this, like the behavior of the self-attention seems to change. Um, and I think that is going to be really integral for getting good um, image representations. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it, it's definitely we like something that transformers can provide you with additional insights, but only if it comes at a cost of uh, having bigger data sets. So yeah, but I'm curious, have you have you used because you have a background of using AI or deep learning for healthcare applications too? Have you ever explored using transformers for any of these standard medical data sets? And yeah. I'm curious, like if you have any uh, anything to report or. I don't know if I missed any out of your works that have been already so, done so on we, that. We did try fine tuning on one of um one medical um imaging data set in our in our paper. I think that plot is in the appendix. That was just understanding like you know what how like how fine tuning was working, whether representations were good and things like that. And that was um and like how much things were changing. So that was nice. Um, but uh, yeah, this was also relevant to your earlier question, but. Yeah, I, I was actually excited about this from the medical perspective also, because one challenge you have with medical images is that um, the images can be very large scale. Um, and so when you're working with like a convolutional net, like, I mean, I don't know, do you like downsample it or like sometimes the batch size has to be smaller. And so I was hoping that with transformer networks, like while you might have to play around to understand like, you know, exactly how large the image patches should be and things of that form, um, transformers might provide us a little bit of an advantage in, in processing mm. these kinds of medical images. Um, I also feel like the what we observed to the transformers that it can take like local and global information into account um, would be very, uh, I think very relevant for some of these medical imaging data sets. Um, so I feel like one architectural problem with uh, CNNs maybe is that sometimes these like medical imaging data sets, what you ideally wanna do is you want to take like local in information into account like a lot and then you want just like a small amount of global in information to maybe understand like where you are in the image or something um because oftentimes the variations you're looking for are, are quite a bit more local um and but then but then like it, it's useful to just have like you know a notion of what the global context is like um and with CNNs, like there's nothing in that structure that like, you know, necessarily helps with that. Like lower down, you're sort of forced to be local, but then higher up, you're like looking at the entire image like all the time. And so is that really the right thing to do? It actually felt like maybe not. Um, this was also one of the things that motivated our study on like different architectures um, for, um, for going from like, you know, natural images to medical images. Like um, some of those architectures are really, um, you know, developed for natural images. And so like have all of these properties that don't quite make sense for medical images. Um, with vision transformers, because we know that they can take like local and global information into account this way earlier on, um, and because we know that, um, yeah, they have like more flexibility to see how much of each they want. Um, I was actually really excited to see whether um, these, uh, yeah, these could be used for, for medical imaging data sets. Um, we haven't done too much yet besides some preliminary experiments in our paper, which is mostly in the context of transfer learning, but that's definitely something I'm hoping to explore more in future. Yeah, 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 that makes two of us definitely. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's something I have been trying on a lot. But uh, again, um, I'm always, I have always uh, regarded uh, all of my experiments to the in-house data set that we have from Mayo Clinic, and it's it's strictly very lesser in size. So I'm mm -hmm. always curious that okay, the transformers won't, won't even wake up if I just have this this many amount of samples. I so mean, I'm it's always possible. I mean, it's possible that with like pre-trained data set or something, it, like if you're like if you're just doing transfer learning and stuff, you might still be able to get them to work like I don't think um like some of the things that they did fine tuning on in the original VIT paper like those data sets aren't particularly big I think and so they just managed to do that with like some of the fine tuning and so I would hmm. be cautiously optimistic that um, <laughs> it could be made to work yeah I, I actually want to ask that because like you said because that was one of the uh question uh, I would say concern that I had for myself is uh -huh. so 
we have we have done uh, like most of the people have done work on transfer learning when they are regarding for natural imaging data sets so they would of course like using pre trained imagenet non uh, imagenet models have been a big uh, consensus among the whole community but i wanted to ask from a theoretical perspective from how the transformers work would it be theoretically wrong let's say if i for medical data sets of course we are just talking about uh, mr scans or something like that um uh, would it be theoretically wrong if i trained a model on a particular pathology of disease or something that has to do with a different application but the uh-huh. modality is the same as in we are talking about ct scans or mr scans okay. consistently uh-huh. and i would fine tune it on a downstream task that has a smaller sample to fine tune on but uh-huh. we are talking about different pathology but same uh, modality same modalities um but I, uh-huh. do you do you think like first of all of course like uh I I don't I don't expect you would say like okay that that's going to be great or not because of course you have we have not done the experiments but would it be theoretically wrong as in would 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 it be wrong as in what transfer uh, your what knowledge is being transferred from the pre training to find fine, uh, fine tuning task yeah, I mean I I think it definitely seems like a reasonable thing to try um earlier on when I saw some of the first work like for example training on chest x-rays because there are some large data sets out there with chest x-rays uh I I was wondering why we weren't you know transferring from chest x-rays to chest x-rays uh, but then what i learned is that when you're training let's like, say a model that has been built for something like imagenet um the diversity of the data sets of something like imagenet is um is is like helpful for uh for like doing conditioning a little faster like one chest x-ray and another chest x-ray are much more similar to each other than like one image and another image from like imagenet um and so i think that diversity is like helpful for some kind of like conditioning or training um mm-hmm. and so i think that would be like a question i would have for uh for for like um training on like say the ct scans um just the ct scans and downstream uh training i mean like there are there are some other options there like if you have ct scans but then and you also have like maybe a natural data set available so this is coming back to multitask learning but i'd be curious to know whether you can just train on both of them at the same time um and then try and that way you get a little bit of in domain um information um but then you also get like the diversity that you have with natural images um and then hopefully you learn like a good stable set of representations that then you can use to to fine tune whatever downstream thing you're interested in most um so that would be oh. thing i'd be curious to try i guess um but i mean otherwise i don't see anything wrong in doing that like it feels very reasonable because you're giving it that image modality and hopefully it's learning something about that um i think the big question there would be you know is the diversity enough um yeah yeah definitely yeah this is yeah that that gives me a slightly bit more of motivation to do that because i was always i was always concerned that the uh, transformers are very data hungry models so uh-huh. that's not going to be uh, something very Uh, well so i yeah, i think yeah. okay so this this is almost turning into a, a research brainstorm but i i think there's a <laughs> i think there's a pretty nice open question there maybe which is suppose you just trained on the ct scans and then you pre-trained on the ct scans and then you fine tuned on the pre-t scan um ct scans what does that look like and then you could do suppose you trained on like image net and then fine tuned on the ct scans what does that look like and then maybe one more experiment like mixing the two like sort of what does that mm. look like and uh i think I think there would be something interesting to say about what those uh what those three like performances looked like. Um Yeah, I I I bet I I definitely <laughs> bet on that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But but to end on the vision transformer thing, one I uh a, a very awkward question I would ask is do you think uh transformers in general the architecture or the model that it belongs to as in what it does, do you think it has the potential or it has already done a paradigm shift the way we are approaching imaging tasks as of now which is the de facto is convolutions right like it's one or the other way we are using convolutions yeah. do you think it has the potential and feel free to say this is a, this is an opinion answer uh, no one's going to uh, quote you on that but do you think transformers uh, have the potential if done correctly to provide something that can cause a paradigm shift with imaging In imaging applications. Uh, yeah, good question. So, uh gosh, okay, so definitely opinion <laughs> answer um so, <laughs> I mean, I do think, you know, I I I think that was definitely on people's minds when that paper first came out. Uh you know, they're not the first papers to think about using transformers for vision, but um because of course transformers are really successful so people were always curious to know whether you could have some variant working in vision um but you know as i understand it felt like some of the prior work had made uh, pretty significant modifications to the transformer architecture itself um before trying to get it to work on vision whereas this one really tried to keep it faithful to like what the architecture exactly looked like for um nlp um 
And so, and so, so that was like really striking the fact that you could take this and then it did well. And, you know, I think there's been like numerous follow-ups that are like, you know, either reproducing the results or like extending it in various settings. And so, you know, I think some of that has, has actually happened. Um, gosh, where does it go from here? I mean, I still think, yeah, you know, I, I still think there are probably some places where we might prefer using uh, a CNN, like, um, so places where maybe you have, like, like some of these, like, large transformer models, which are working the best, they are very big, so, 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 like, those might not be, you know, as appropriate for, um, for every application, like, I think things like ResNet, for example, have been around for a long time, and there are many places where those work reliably, so it would be surprising if those just suddenly all disappeared, um, but, you know, I think there will be a, like, a whole suite of applications that are opened up by things we're doing and you know some places where we're going to replace places where we had ResNet with a transformer uh you know I think one of the most um interesting opportunities with like the this this use of vision transformers is of course all of these multimodal considerations um so OpenAI came out with their clip training framework like early this year um and that was very interesting being able to do the um the joint embeddings of language and vision and then doing this sort of um inner producting um together and having that be um, be like a new way of learning things. Um, I think I think things like that are going to be really exciting, and um, maybe from that angle, it's a little easier to have architectural similarity between vision and language. Um, I'm also hopeful for you know potential like medical applications there. Like um, you know we talked about explainability in the beginning. Um, it would be very cool if we could get our systems to explain themselves better in natural language. That would be a very interesting direction to go. So if things like that come out of it, um, that could be really cool. Um, but yeah, so so maybe to summarize, uh, I think um, definitely for larger scale applications, I think transformers are going to be really strong. Um, I think um, I think for some of the existing applications where we're using CNNs that are maybe also slightly large scale in nature, like transformers could be useful. And then places where like you know transfer learning is possible, um, you're you're you know you're also going to see that. Um, I certainly think there are going to be plenty of places where people are still using convnets going forward. Um, and I think for some of the multimodal work, however, we really might see um, a lot of use of transformers just because it seems really nice to have um, uniformness of architectures across like language and vision. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I really like the last part. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting, definitely. And 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 talking more like deviating more on your work on the medical data sets because you have been working on the applications and understanding these uh, model representations when we are dealing with medical data sets. So. Yeah. Of course, like you would, you would expect this question to be coming. Is we often like one of the biggest uh, uh, problem with medical data data sets is the size, right? So, what do you think, like in terms of because I have explored a lot of papers who talk about few shot learning, k shot learning, one shot learning, zero shot learning, but none of them have the sufficient amount of proof to show if we can scale yeah. that idea even for medical data sets, yeah, right? Yeah. So. So where do you think, like, of course, transformer is one thing that we uh, we really talk like that's an open question. Apart from that, do you do you see the potentials in any of the other techniques that people might not know or that could have a potential? Like you see a significant amount of people or interest in the research community for small data sets in medical data. Yeah, uh, so medical I, mean, I, think I, I think I do. So, I mean, this is something that, you know, people might already be familiar with, but um, one thing that has really um, surprised me in a very positive way is just over, say, 2019, um, especially like I think 2019 and some of 2020, um, you know, how much progress we made in things like semi-supervised learning and self-supervision. Um, so, you know, language already had this nice property that you have like sort of next token kind of things. And then maybe with the vision transformer, you can do, you can try and get something like that to work for in the, in the image context also, like so some kind of like next patch prediction. And that's like a new self-supervision paradigm that's come out now. But but, um, but otherwise, like, you know, there have just been all of these efforts that like, like through contrastive learning of some kind, usually um, that have been uh, like really pushing the boundaries of what we can do with self-supervision and semi-supervised learning. Um, so I think I'm pretty optimistic. So, so yeah. So if I was looking at a domain where there was very little data, I think what I'd want to do is, you know, um, do take a pre-trained model, um, then try and see like, if there's like, you know, if you can get like a chunk of unlabeled data, then look at doing some like, you know, semi-supervised learning. And then if the unlabeled data isn't available, then just look at doing um, some like, uh, yeah, like some, like, I guess, careful, like transfer learning from the, the pre-trained setup. And I guess I'm like cautious and, and like, 
especially for medical images that are like larger scale, I think you can also do quite a bit of data augmentation to, to increase the size of the data set. Um, that tends yeah. to work well because they often have high resolution. Um, so there's there's more scope to do augmentation, I guess. So I it, it depends on the precise size of the data set and things, of course. Um, but I guess I'm optimistic about um, being able to do much more um, with smaller size data sets with the like uh, with like the enormous advances we've seen in both like self supervision and semi supervised learning and um, um, and, and and just like again improving aspects of transfer learning like I do think this is one case where like model scale is helping us where you can have some of these large scale models but they actually have amazingly good representation so they can actually be very efficient to do transfer learning on which is sometimes counterintuitive you take a large model and you're like gosh like I can never use this like it's so it's going to be so yeah. expensive to or, or like so expensive data wise at least um uh to to like um fine tune like I'm going to need so many data points but that may often not be true because these larger models might just have really strong representation. So often they'll need very little data to fine tune um, and start doing well on whatever task you're, you're most interested in. Um, so I think so. I think I'm actually very optimistic on all of this. And those are some of the techniques and directions I would think about if, if I were trying to, to carry this out. Yeah, it's a, it's a very weird sp uh, sweet spot between the model sizes because we, if you have a smaller model, they are not suitable for transfer learning. And if they are too large, it's harder to update uh, if you have a very fine-tuned, like very small fine-tuned data set, if, if, I'm, I'm, if I'm correct. I'm not sure if that's the exact uh, conclusion, but it's a very sweet spot between like what should be the model size if you want to do a very good amount of transfer learning. So I, uh, yeah, I yeah, I... I think the larger models might help there. Like, I mean, there are, of course, compute challenges. So like there's like some, you know, maybe maybe you don't want to go for something ginormous like that might be like a pain, but you know, <laughs> taking taking like taking some computation considerations into account, um, I think some of the larger models might be helpful for fine tuning, even if they're, um, yeah, even if there's like a smaller amount of data uh, available. That, that would be my, I mean, again, probably application dependent a little bit and things, but I guess a priority, yeah. I guess. Yeah, 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 definitely. And one one last question I have before we move on to a slightly lesser technical domain is from, uh, you have been working on analyzing the representations of these models. So from an internal representation perspective, and I, I'll have to admit, I don't know much about causality. I, I just uh, read papers in a, in a, in a awe of uh, reading about something that's going to change things uh, uh, that can help us understand things better. But I don't know much about the causalities uh, or what, what the research about causality really goes. But what can you say about, like representations help us understand what the model learns in terms of what are the structural or the uh, phys physical or tangible things that we learn, but what can representations or these internal workings help us understand the causalities between the uh, learned features or data sets, data points, I would say. Is there any work being done where people are trying to understand causality or causality, causal reasoning of these uh -huh. models uh, and can representations help us? Um. So... I think uh, I think for that you definitely want to run some of these interventional experiments. So you have some hypothesis, and then you change something, maybe about how the model is trained, and then you test that out. Um, we do try and do things like that when we analyze representations. So our usual like workflow is that we'll you know take some system and we might be analyzing its representations. That will give us some you know clear hypothesis or insight on what we think is going on, and then we'll usually try and separately test that in some way. Um, you know by changing like the training mechanism or or um, I don't know, like ablating something or something of that form. Um, so I think if you're going to do this for data sets, um, or like, oh, sorry, thinking about maybe the connection between data and like what the model is learning, um, what I would be tempted to do, I guess, is like also trying to think of some kind of ablation style study. So mm -hmm. like maybe this set of classes on the data sets, like if I remove those, like how does that affect properties of the representation? Um, and so once you've done that interventional test, so you have like test A and test B, like different variations of how you're maybe training this model, for example, um, then that's definitely a place where representation like analysis could help you. You'd look at the, the learned representations in both of these. So, sorry, so you'd have like some sense of maybe um, like errors and outputs, um, like, you know, sort of for free once you've done this. Um, and then you might want to look at like, I don't know, like internal representations or even just like things like saliency and stuff to understand whether there are um, other differences between these systems that are worth taking into account. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. And I I want to graduate towards the idea uh, that is slightly less technical. And uh -huh. since most of the people who are listening to this podcast are, I would say, 
people who are interested in research or I would say masters or PhD okay. students. So I want to ask a question about along the lines of uh, understanding your thought process when you were a PhD student. So okay. first of all, how did how did you decide your own PhD research topic? And secondly, would you have any advice uh, for people who are trying to develop the research topic or thesis or in general, the idea that what they want to work on? Uh, so can, can you talk to more about like what was your thought process then? Yeah, so um, I think I think developing that and, and you know, I think oftentimes like uh, maybe something close to what I would advise people, I, I think is also probably my experience just because organically, this is often like the way things turn out to be. But um, yeah, I guess it's like some combination, sort of high level, it's some combination of exploration to find out, you know, what you're really excited about. And then once you've found something that's more exciting, you can then, you know, really push on that and really flesh it out as a direction. Um, in terms of exploring, so like, I think, um, so I think like concretely, you know, maybe you want to be doing some combination of, you know, spending time really like learning about like um, certain papers or techniques that you start off being excited about. Um, and then at the same time, you're trying to work on concrete projects to understand, um, like to really dive into the details of um, like of, of trying to do research there. And these two things sort of feed off of each other. Like um, when you first start reading papers, it's you know, it's illuminating and it's interesting, but um, the depth in which you understand them is different once you've started doing research yourself in that area, because you better understand, you know, what are the important parts, what are the less important parts, what are you most interested by, what's less exciting to you, things like that. Um, and so you like kind of go back and forth between these. Um, I'd say for like starting PhD students, I would recommend, you know, like doing this for maybe um, it's sequentially, but like, you know, sequentially for like a couple of different areas they're excited about. So maybe you pick one area and then you try and learn about it, work on a project too, and you're doing a combination of following that area and then also trying to work on a project, um, try and wrap up that project also, or like, you know, like see the project to completion is what I would say, because um, that like that process of working through a project until it's like a, a paper is like really a, an important part of doing research also. Um, so you do that and then you get some sense of that area and then maybe you pick another area that you're excited about um, or or like, or somehow if the first area you picked is just magical, then maybe you just continue, <laughs> you, you found the area you're really excited about. Um, and so then, but um, but if not, and you're you know excited about other areas also, maybe you know you do this again, or you you do this a couple of times, basically like a few times. And so then once you've done that, you've written a few papers, you've gotten a sense of what that process is like, you know what doing research is like, you've learned a lot about the field. Um, and then at that stage, you can start getting a sense of like, okay, well you know what did I like most about this? Like what direction would I like to go? How am I seeing like you know things like evolve in the field? Also, what's like the new work coming out that's exciting me? And so then and then that will like. Um, help maybe inform like the the next set of projects you start working on um, and then by that point like you know slowly cookies like a, a theme will start forming um, and so then like a some like at some stage like you know a few years into your PhD you can usually look at all the work you've done and there's like you know some clearer themes that are coming out of that um, and so then I think like you know kind of maybe midway or like in the like latter half of your PhD or so like that's when you're sort of taking some of the themes that are coming out and then like maybe really pushing on them to um, because you realize that those are like the directions you're most interested in and then you're like maybe exploring them to like their full or like studying other questions there that you thought were interesting that like came out. Um, yeah. This process also gets easier once again like I mean one other nice thing about like actually doing the research is um, in some ways this process also gets easier once you've actually written some papers because through the process of doing that you can usually look back at your own papers and be like ah oh, but I wish you'd like answered these questions or things like that <laughs> and that like also feeds into um, you know, directions to go in or like uh, ways to ways to form like a, a body of work, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, this feels more like uh, a, like in a way, in a way, you have to take a brute force approach. If if that's what I'm getting to it, is mo more like a eventual gradient based. Uh, you know, like eventually you will learn. Yeah, you will you will try to deviate uh, along a few of the parts, I mean, but eventually. I brute force because you're not trying like everything. No, not everything is not equal. You're trying out like a. Okay, so some people might come into it, like typically if you've had some research experience already or you've been following some research area very closely and you've decided you're interested in that, then chances are like you probably have a good read of it and you should just go do that. Um, but alternatively, what happens is sometimes people come into it and, you know, they have like an, a range of interests, but like they're not quite sure the exact like thing that they're interested in or they're interested in exploring a few things. Um, and then in that case, like, you know, it's nice to, you know, try out like a few things just to get a sense of it. And then that will also give you a sense of what you like. And then you can kind of go from there. 
Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, um, I mean, by brute force, I meant like in a in a strictly domain, like you'll have to pick up a domain where you will be doing a lot of um, explorations. But yeah, 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 that's 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 very interesting. But, but and, still, and, still, uh, still guided by your interests. Like you should still look at that. Yeah. And, <laughs> like the question you decide to work on should excite you. Like if you pick some question and you're like, I'm not sure why I'm working on this. That's like not the <laughs> not the best thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And and I I recall this particular thing that you mentioned out in your blog that I I read some time back, which uh, which talked about like your reflections of your uh, PhD journey or something. And one interesting thing that you mentioned, which luckily I have never stuck into it as of now, at least I would say, is the idea of feeling stuck. You know, like as in feeling like. Uh, you are not progressing or for, for a myriad of reasons you could feel stuck so can you talk more about that because uh, I, I can hear these I can actually sense that okay what feeling stuck might feel like uh, down the line but can you talk more about like why what does what does what do you mean by feeling stuck in these kind of scenarios when you're doing your PhD or in general research projects and what would be your advice as in like if someone is feeling stuck about something what's the approach he or she should have in order to, um, uh, you know, get out of the stuck yeah. phase. So, so I think I, I discussed some of this in my blog post, so people should definitely go check that out if they want more details. Um, so I think the, so, so, you know, during your PhD, there are going to be like, you know, various times where you have some project and it's like frustrating because it's like taking it's like sweet time or, you know, it's been rejected a couple of times and then you need to like work on it further to try and get it accepted somewhere, things like that. Um, that's like, you know, those are common experiences and those are, those are like, you know, those are often okay, like they're frustrating to go through, but they're not at a place where you're like despairing or something. Um, I think there's a there's another version that I've seen where, which I haven't experienced quite to the to, to degree of extremeness, but I do know of other people um, who have had that experience, maybe even more so. Um, and, and that's this phase where like, it's usually earlier on in your PhD. So um, earlier on, you know, you're working on maybe like your first project or something, and you know, you're working on it, and it just feels like, you're not making any progress. Like you're trying all of these things and like things are either not working out or like for some reason you feel like you're really stuck. And I think it's a big difference when it's like your first project um, as opposed to like a later project or one of a couple of projects because it's common to get stuck on things. Um, and like, you know, when you, as you have more research experience, you know how to handle that feeling also. Like you might have some other projects you concentrate on for a while. You could put this one on a pause or like, if you have other papers and you write one paper and it's just like not going anywhere, maybe you decide to like return to some of the directions you want to explore out of one of your other papers and like explore that. So there are like, you know, lots of things you can do. Um, I think I think the hardest point to get stuck is like maybe towards the beginning if you're working on like a first project and like you just feel like, um, you know, it's, it's hard to get it anywhere. Um, and so for that one, I guess like, um, I think firstly, the most important thing to do is like to really take stock of like the state that you're in. So like, you know, what concrete things have like you done? Do you have any concrete results? Like, um, you know, like, like, and like any experiments or any other results. And like, often I've like found that like you can um, writing up like where you are at with like all of your intermediate results and things like that is that is a good place to um, good thing to do because you just get like a, a, a nice sense of state of like where things are at. Um, and then, uh, and then, so once you've gotten that, sometimes like just seeing that all come together, it's clear like what maybe the next step should be or like why you're stuck. And so if that happens, yeah. then okay, great, you should go like um, do, do that. But you know, if you write this up and then you're like, I'm still not sure what to do, um, then there are you know like a few options. Like one option is to ask um, some of like you know maybe your um, your other PhD students or like your advisor or other collaborators and things to take a look at this and see whether they have immediate thoughts on like. Um, what's going on and oftentimes that can be quite useful um, like you know at some stages if you're stuck um, and again you have like these results um, you know presenting your work to somebody like at a workshop or like some intermediary phase um, can be really good because again like um, through discussions and when you have like new pairs of eyes seeing it like oftentimes like things can just come up that you might not have thought of and then you might find that very interesting to look at. Um, another thing is to see whether like, you know, the things that you've done so far might have some connection to like some other direction that's interesting and like um, going on in the, the field. And so like, is there some connection there? Like, you know, are there related problems you could also study in this? Like, are there, um, yeah, like you want to like pivot certain aspects to like another, like maybe more tractable direction, things like that. Um, and so like, you know, again, oftentimes like either looking for connections or like some slight new formulation or something might actually like um, like sort of really uh, solve the like being stuck problem. And then you might again find directions to like um, make progress. 
Um, and then and then finally, there's this case, which um, I don't think happens that often, but like very occasionally, I think it can happen that you might have just started with like, you know, just a very difficult project to begin with. And um, for some reason, you know, you've done this work and like it's been, um, you've tried, you know, you've tried all these things, you've tried talking to other people, you've tried talking to like, you've tried seeing what connections there are, you've tried like, you know, reformulating the problem, all of that, you've like read through the current state and written it all up. Um, then at that stage, if you feel like nothing is working, um, then that could be time to like move on from the project, in which case it's worth just like, it is worth getting that final write up just so you have a record of your work and you know, you could post it onto the archive, for example. Um, I think intermediate results are things that don't work or important for people to know and, and sort of share that. And then and then you could look at moving on to, to another project, hopefully informed by like some of the things that you've learned. So um, maybe you like realize like, you know, why maybe you got stuck here and then maybe more promising directions to go at and making that transition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, I, I completely agree to that, and but in a very nice state because I, I don't have that much amount of experience. But one thing I'm realizing is something that's really important to do a uh, very stable amount of work is connecting the dots. As in, like you might be trying out a lot of things, but if you really pick on the key findings that you had from, like, okay, if something didn't work, what was the exact reason? And the next decision you take, as in exploring, yeah. it has to come up from the past dots that you have connected or past findings that you have had. And so that's that's one thing that I'm learning, like as in I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna take a blind vote onto exploring things, but I would be make, making a much more um, consensus-based decision, like, okay, right, right, why right. should I do that? Yeah, yeah so yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that, that can definitely be useful. And then that, that can often also very easily end up with like a string of results that end up forming like a nice paper because you like try one thing and then um, maybe it doesn't work but then maybe there's some deeper reason why it doesn't work and so then you explore that further and things like that and then as you go through suddenly you're like oh well this is like actually like a a, a nice set of results and this is the kind of thing that would be that would be nice to like share in a paper or something yeah 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 and and one other question i had but maybe maybe like a tip from you that i uh, that i love that i can learn is we talked about it in the early uh, early uh, part of this podcast is uh, the field feels to be much more overwhelmed right like it's it's too much amount of work for anyone to cope up with so what were some of the tips that you would say you have right now as a researcher or as a research scientist that you can share versus what you would have as a graduate student like how did you keep used to keep up with so much amount of work that was being published uh making a meaning out of it and then extracting whatever information you can for your own research work like how how do you manage yeah um, so I think um, I think once you have your specific interests defined, um, and like obviously I've been in the field for some years, so like I guess I have sort of the specific interests that I'm um, most excited about. It's it's okay to keep up with it. I'd say like at, even at this stage because um, you know there there I'm talking about something very specific. Like maybe I'm looking a lot at like you know um, like uh, representation analysis methods or something, and then like you know you'll see some papers and then come up, and then even if you don't quite read all of them, you're still seeing the evolution of like interesting papers come out and sort of things like that. Um, I think keeping up with the field on the whole is like very hard. Um, so so that's <laughs> not what I'd recommend. I'd say like. I'd say like for, for things that you're very interested in, like I think reading, um, I think, you know, kind of taking more effort to like, you know, like at least read abstracts. And then if you decide to work on something in that direction, try and read the entire paper and like occasionally read entire papers, of course, is um, is like, is definitely a good thing to do. Um, then there's like, um, then I think trying to make time for papers that have had like a huge impact on the field. So like, you know, some paper comes out and like just everyone is excited about it and talking about it, then like makes sense to like set aside time to try and really read that to understand what's going on, what got people excited, things like that. Um, and then like, and then if at some stage you're working on something and then, you know, you decide there's this other related area that you're excited on learning things about, um, then at that point you can try and get a whole number of papers in that area and just like read through them, you know, all together with like the goal of like learning as much as you can about that area. And that can be a great way to like quickly um, pick up on, um, you know, all the things that are happening. Also, I'd say that these days, again, because we have so many resources, um, there are a lot of things out there that you can go and then try and uh, use to, so like, you know, there are like blog posts, there's code, there's like uh, like video tutorials, like all of those. Um, so again, if there's like some area that you're um, excited about and you're seeing that people have presented like, you know, the, the results in various ways or somebody else has written up a nice summary, that's like also a useful resource to, to take into account. It'll hopefully save you time in understanding the main points and then um, also convey those in, in, a, in a good way to you. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. 
um but yeah uh yeah that's that's all i had for you for the questions i had for this particular podcast so um i hope uh, people listening to this uh find this useful i'll be linking to uh I'll, i'll be putting a link to your website and uh ca- how can people learn more about your uh recent works i think uh as in like uh how can they because by by no means uh we covered all of your works over here so can how can people learn more about your research works that you are working right now currently yeah thanks um so i would say uh so yeah so i guess on my website i have my papers i also have uh i guess a twitter account like many other people on machine learning where i share <laughs> the findings of all our work um and then um maybe check out like some of the other talks and things I've given um so we'll be attending Europe's um I'm also speaking at like one of the workshops there um this will be more on work on like um like human AI decision making related things um so so I think yeah maybe that's another piece of advice talks are also a great way to learn about works that are out there so um, so yeah. not making for me and for other people that's a that's like a nice thing to look at to to see what people are working on now and some of the questions that they're thinking about yeah i'll i'll be putting a li- link to all of the things that you mentioned in the description below but yeah uh, hopefully yeah people can find information and they can reach out to you if they have any specific questions that they they can ask yeah. so but yeah thanks thanks a lot for being here and i hope this was uh, meaningful to, for people who are listening yeah yeah thanks uh, thanks so much for inviting me and uh, it was a really fun discussion and uh, you know i wish any uh like younger researchers who might be tuning into this you know best of luck with their phd's and uh definitely <laughs> it's a very exciting time to be in the field so um, exciting exciting days and uh much ahead i think definitely definitely all right